Hello, and welcome to Crate Expectations. I'm Tom Kennedy, and today I'm bringing you the second instalment of our new series, Introduce Yourself, a collection of interviews with record enthusiasts around the world. My guest today is Melbourne record collector Michael of At You Collect Vinyl Now. Michael grew up in a musical household. His dad was in the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, and his mother was a ballet dancer, and this passion for the arts rubbed off on him in a big way. To say Michael is an avid collector would be putting it mildly. He has amassed a huge and eclectic record collection, and it was great fun exploring his musical biography with him. So here is Introduce Yourself with Michael from At You Collect Vinyl Now. Michael, thank you for joining us uh, for our second episode of Introduce Yourself, where we profile uh, record collectors from around the world. You uh, you share your record collection, your immense record collection, via uh, at You Collect Vinyl Now and You Collect Aussie Vinyl Now on Instagram. Uh, before we get into your picks, your your vinyl biography, so to speak, just tell us a bit about uh, how you got into record collecting and a rough guess of how many thousands of records are sitting behind you. <laughs> um, look, yeah, look, thank you. It's, uh, yeah, it's nice to be here. Um, I, I've always been a music fan. Um, I grew up in a, in a very artsy kind of house. My dad um, uh, was an orchestra musician uh, for 40 odd years. He played in the Melbourne Symphony, um, yeah. played double bass, you know, and uh, music, been exposed to music through that. Um, Mum was in the Australian Ballet as well. So it was always like it was a very artsy kind of home. Um, and yeah, like I, his record collection, his music, you know, when you kind of look at the shelves and look at my collection, you know, it's very much kind of mid sixties, late seventies, early eighties, you know, as a 41 year old man, that is the music of, you know, our parents' generation, um, which I have no qualms about. I'm not embarrassed about it. Um, yeah. And as I, you know, in my teens, as I kind of started to, I guess, get a bit of money and, you know, CDs, obviously the thing, um, you know, buying music and, you know, ingesting it that way, pre-internet, you know, for people that <clears throat> remember that, you know, you had to go to mm. brushes and you had to go to buy CDs and stuff. Um, and yeah. And then, you know, as soon as I started working full time um, after I left uni, I just went to town. Like I, I spent my first paycheck, um, my first adult paycheck, I went to um, a JB Hi-Fi um and I spent the whole thing in one go. I bought the uh, I bought there's this um back in the mid 80s they released a Beatles complete album CD set in a wooden box. This really mm. lovely black wooden box with like a roll-up thing. And I bought that and it was lavish and silly um and it was great. And from then, you know, I master I had thousands of CDs. Like I just bought I had so many CDs um into my kind of late 20s, early 30s. Um and then I and then I decided uh, it wasn't that vinyl was like, I mean, the revival was happening. Like we knew there was kind of a revival mm. happening. Um, it hadn't really exploded like it has now. Um, and so I decided to buy a, a record player. I went to a um, hi-fi place down in, um, down in Carlton here in Melbourne. Um, and, yeah, bought a, bought a nice a nice turntable amp um, and had some speakers already and just, yeah, started buying records, you know, Um I ultimately sold the CDs um, in one go, actually. Like CDs, but like yeah, I, right. I really, I, I dived into like audio file CDs, you know, the gold 24 carat stuff and, you know, like a, a master collection. Yeah. Um, and, I, yeah, as I started to collect records, I played CDs less. I was like, what am I going to do with these? Like do I move them house to house? Yeah. You know, I'm going to sell them. And thankfully a, a local actually bought them off me. Um, the owner and I were quite good friends and I'm like, you know, do you want these? And he's like, look, I'll give you like a buck, a buck fifty a piece. And I was like, sold, boxed them up, took them yep. in. That was the end of my CD life. Um, and you've never looked back. <laughs> I've never looked back. And yet, I mean, I, I think about that and I think about the guys and well, the guys and girls that offloaded their collections of records in the 90s. Like they were mm. putting those in dumpsters. Yeah. They couldn't just, you know, couldn't get rid of them. Um, you know, and I guess records, I mean, the idea of records coming back is just, you know, in the history of technology, like I can't think of another technology that has come back with yeah. such force. Like this technology that's come back as niche things, like say Laserdisc or something, but, but records... Um, you know, I don't regret selling the CDs. You know, I, I think CD, I think it's a great format and, you know, it does sound amazing and there are just, you know, it's a golden age for CD collectors because yeah. they're everywhere and you can get box sets that might have been $300 new for 10 bucks. 
um, you know, and a lot of stuff that still hasn't found its way into vinyl. I mean, yeah, a lot of yeah. those, those big box sets, even, you know, all these box sets back here, when they were pressed or when they were put on CD, there still would have been other tracks and other stuff that we never got on vinyl. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm not a CD snob. I, I think pick the medium and the format that works for you, you know, ultimately it's about music. Yeah, no, no, spot on. So uh, we are here to talk about your record collection and I'm not sure how you would have whittled this down to six choices because um, to the listeners there is industrial strength shelving behind you holding up your very impressive collection. Uh, we're going to kick it off with uh, it's quite quite daunting to think about but the the record that you choose to introduce yourself with. Beck C Change. Yeah, I am... Um... I like it's in the nineties. Like I was in the, I was in high school in the nineties, so kind of ninety three through to ninety eight mm. was my high school years. Um, and the stuff that I was interested interested in at that time, like Jamiroquai was big. I love Ben Folds Five. Like yep. I was I was a, a piano player. I was a self taught piano player. And like Ben Folds, he was the you know he was the real deal. The guy. In Melbourne, yeah. and I saw him live. You know at the Palais Theatre down here in St Kilda. Um, and he was amazing. Like he went on national television at on the midday show and played One Angry Dwarf and smashed the piano. Like, you know, legend. Yeah. Um, and Beck was another one, like Midnight Vultures, um, you know, mixed business and you know, that kind of stuff. That had that had come out. Um <clears throat> and I took a real deep dive into Beck. Um, like I grew to really, really love Beck. Um, and as you kind of go through Beck's discography. Um, he's really fascinating because almost more than any other artist I can think of, no album sounds the same. Yeah. Like when you, you when you go through his entire kind of catalogue from the like the really early stuff, um, nothing sounds the same. And even even kind of post sea change, um, you know, he did obviously um, uh, morning phase as the kind of you know sequel. But sea change is this just this beautiful kind of moment in musical time. It is. It is kind of slow and it is ethereal and it gets a lot of shit, I think, from people that either aren't Beck fans or maybe they are Beck fans and don't really like the extremely laid back, mm. um, very consistent tone as well. Like when you when you look, listen to all the songs, um, there's a very consistent like tempo and kind yeah. of feel to it. Um, and it's almost, it's almost like a dream. Like I can't think of, you know, too many other albums before that, um, and even albums that have come after it by other, you know, acts, there's a very, I mean, obviously there's a very indie kind of feel to it that we yeah. now see a lot. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that album, um, the production, it sounds incredible. Like it's it's one of those albums that particularly with the mobile fidelity pressing, which is, you know, not that, not that it really matters. Like the thing about, you know, albums is, you listen to them and you enjoy them. Like, you know, on a cassette, you know, in a Datsun 180, mm -hmm. you're still listening to great music. It doesn't really matter. Um, but when you can sit and kind of listen with big speakers and just kind of focus on it and, you know, the best possible pressing you can find, um, you're almost in the studio, um, you know, and it just envel it just kind of, you know, surrounds you. Uh, and I love that. I, th I think Sea Change, I don't think he's ever done anything that is better than that. I mean, I think he's done stuff that is as interesting and musically interesting, but as an album and the, you know, the, the consistency of it and the experience of it, it's his best album. Um, yeah, hands down. So. It's interesting that you went with Beck uh, for to introduce yourself because I think record collectors generally are quite have quite eclectic tastes in music. Or any any collectors of music, you've got this kind of bro broad spectrum of music that you can pull from mm. the shelf based on your mood. And as you said, his his discography is so broad and so mm. eclectic. Um, it's it's almost it's almost like he's a reflection of of your taste in music because you can go to any one of those and based on your mood, mm. that that's kind of you know that's that's why Beck is you know still interesting because mm. everything is different. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and I, yeah, I think you're right. I think collectors, the the collections that I like most and that I admire most, you know. So I guess you know in the Instagram community or, or people that I know personally and their collections. I'm, I'm always interested by collections that are extremely narrow. So people that, you know, whether it's, you know, Norwegian death metal or it's EDM or mm. it's classical or it's only, you know, pre-war jazz or whatever. Um, I understand loving something and loving a genre. Um, but, you know, like everything from Randy Newman to Japanese city pop to the Beatles to Wilco to, you know, like it, it's all kind of in there for me mm. and it's, 
just music that I love. I don't really care. I don't, I don't care whether it's fashionable or not or whether it's cool or not or whether it's, you know, Little River Band is in there because Little River Band is one of Australia's great bands mm-hmm. and I will, you know, always defend what is good music and what you'd like has to exist in isolation, you know, and I think one of the things that happens on Instagram, which is, you know, I've been on there for three or so years now, is as nice as as nice as pretty much everybody is to a degree, there is definitely there is definitely a lot of opinions that people have on things that they seem to think carry a lot of weight. Mm. Now, whether it's about the music, whether it's about, I mean, you go down the kind of audio file or the like the sound quality or the pressing kind of rabbit hole and you get a lot of opinions that may be right, might not be right, ultimately don't matter, um, you know, and I think it's the more barriers you put between the enjoyment of music you know, and yourself, I think the worse off you are, um, you know, and anyone gives you shit about what you like, tell them to get stuffed. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no. um, well, you know, like I've got the Backstreet Boys in there because Millennium is an incredible album. It's it's just, a, you know, Backstreet's Back is one of the great, great pop songs and that happily sits comfortably there next to, you know, Roxy Music or whatever else. Yeah, you're spot on. I mean, the, there is a, a bit of gatekeeping, thankfully not a heap, but... At the end of the day, music's about enjoyment. So what you know, whatever your reason for collecting is, uh, mm. it should be about sitting down and, and enjoying listening to music. So yeah. yeah, you know, we should we shouldn't judge others for for what's on their shelf for sure. No, and you know, I think it's it's also there's a bit of a socioeconomic thing that happens as well a lot. You know, whether it's criticising someone's turntable or you know saying that there's a better pressing that they should have bought or this that or the other. Um, and I I'm not backwards in coming forwards. Like I get into a few kind of fist mm. fight on Instagram. Um, you know, as somebody that I mean, A doesn't care. You know, I'm happy to you know have any, an issue with someone online and you know going to bat, but also. Um, yeah, it, it ultimately doesn't matter, you know, whether someone's using a Crosley, you know, and we, we love to have the Crosley discussion. It's like, well, mm. it's not ideal. Of course it's not ideal, you know, but it gets the job done and everybody's journey in anything, whether it's in cars or it's in houses or clothes or watches or whatever, starts at a point yeah. and, and progresses generally if they're really into it. Um, and advice is fine. Like people ask me, I get questions all day, every day, you know, DMs about stuff. And, you know, I think I, and I hate the word influence, but I think, you know, there's definitely people that have either bought things or kind of sought things out because I've posted them or spoken about them, which is fab. Um, but yeah, the rest of it, you know, and it's also, you know, and this is a whole different kind of subject, but women on Instagram and the the female collectors and the Mm. female, you know, um, you collectors in the community, they they have a lot to deal with. They you know? cop a hard time. They cop sure. a hard time. Yeah. And I, I, I feel, you know, and like it's, you know, I, I, not to sound patronising, but I, I really feel for the experience they have because yeah. it's so different to mine. You know, like if I, there are female collections and collectors out there that are, that, you know, dwarf mine, make mine look tiny, you know. There's some incredible collections. Mm. But the fact that they're women, the assumption is either it's bought for, by somebody else, it's their boyfriend's collection, you know, how could they possibly understand or appreciate or be a fan of X artists? It's like, mm, so ridiculous. Like, what are we doing? You know, yeah. why, why is this so hard? And then you've got the guys that just want attention and they dress that up as offering advice, being the good guy, blah, blah, blah. And, like, it's so they think everybody's a moron. It's like, you know, no, you know, if you're a woman and you deal with this every day, you work this shit out really quickly, yeah. um, you know, and I've never, like in three years, I have never had any crap ever from a single account. Mm. That's insane. Like if I was all instantly a 25-year-old female and started showing my collection, it would start the second I posted and it yeah. would be incessant every day. Um, yeah, there's always some hero with expert oh. advice and, yeah. And do you know what? If if we want the vinyl revival to continue and, and thrive further, you actually need people with, with Crosley's, you know, mm. just starting out because that passion and enthusiasm and that growing kind of vinyl community is, you know, and youthful vinyl community, mm. new people getting into the, um, into the hobby, that's the reason that they're pressing new albums onto vinyl because oh. people are buying them. Absolutely, you know, and I, I, I reckon every third time I'm in a record store, there is some young person there buying rumours. 
Mm. Rumours yeah. and dark side of the moon. <laughs> the gateway are, drug. They, these are the backbone of the entire vinyl industry, yeah. like hands yeah. down. You speak to any record store owner, they are the albums that, you know, they're keeping the lights on and there's the, the profit in that. And that's great. Like if you, you know, if you're getting into, into records, you know, I mean, there's worse places to start. If you just want to experience it, you know that Rumours is a great album, you know, yeah. you love Mac. Um, yeah, like the the snobbery around all the aspects of it. You're right. Like you, you, you've got to be inclusive. You've got to bring people in. Um, and the fact that there is a resurgence, the fact we're opening new pressing plants around the world, you know, yeah. like big companies like Sony, you know, that shut them 30 years ago and they're like, holy hell. We've got to open it, yeah. We've got, open, We've got a backlog. Know? Vinyl Me Please opening their own pressing plant, which is, you know, that's a huge thing. Yeah. Um, There's one opening in Brisbane, actually. Yeah, um, so I read that. Yeah, yeah. Um, suitcase Records. Yeah. 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 It's really cool. It, that's very cool, you know, I, absolutely. And it's the community, and not that not that CD collectors or cassette collectors or, you know, um, uh, high-res streaming, you know, fans, like there's a community around, mm. uh, around all of those, but... The vinyl resurgence, like I think anyone that thinks it's a bubble, I don't think quite understands how both the economy works but also just, you know, fads do come and go, um, you know. And, I mean, I only started collecting 10 years ago. Yep. People were collecting, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. It was starting to embryotic, embryonically come back. Um, but I would expect that we'll be buying vinyl, new vinyl, in 20 years' time. Like that's how big I think this is. Um so, yeah, we'll see. I, from I hope it's here to stay, um, you know, yeah. to, for buying the new vinyl but also for keeping all those all those uh, bricks and mortar stores open and, oh. you know, those people that you go and have a chat to who are passionate about, you know, they're, they're your guru who you go mm. and ask about a certain band or ask about a certain pressing, you know, that's, yeah. uh, that's part of the community that I think is really awesome that they survived those tough years and now mm. that they're sort of reaping the benefits of that patience. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, like during COVID, I don't know, you know about other capital cities, but Melbourne, we, I mean, Melbourne, I mean, you know, I'm biased because I live in Melbourne, but I think Melbourne is really, in terms of secondhand record stores, we are really, you know, the great city in mm. Australia for that. We just have so many. Um, and we didn't lose one during COVID. Not one closed down. Um, you know, we all, I think, locals banded together. You know, they were doing lots of click and collect. They were doing lots mm. of um, home deliveries. Um, so I, I reckon for most of COVID, I saw Warwick from Greville Records in Paran more at my house <laughs> than my family or my mother and father. Um, you know, he'd be, he'd be once a week, you know, we'd have a chat, you know, and it was, it was lovely. And I, I kind of went out of my way to buy as much as I could locally from those mm. local stores, you know, as opposed to kind of either overseas yeah. or eBay or whatever. Um, because once they're gone, they never come back. Yeah. We um, actually got a new one, uh, a sister store to uh, one of yours down in Melbourne. In Dutch, Dutch final, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, oh. and they they quickly become one of the best stores in Brisbane. Oh, look, so the the Melbourne store, I was actually there two hours ago, the uh, the Dutch one um, <laughs> in Abbotsford. Yeah, one of one of Melbourne's best stores and they have so much of my money, it actually makes me a bit kind of nauseous thinking about it. You actually um, helped them open the Brisbane chapter. <laughs> well, what I do do is when they get mobile fidelity stuff that comes in through collections they buy, bless them, they'll actually message me on Instagram mm. first often and say, hey, look, do you want this? Do you need this? So I'm looking over at the shelf now and there's, yeah, there's more than a few there that, uh, that came through them, through them. And that's what you want. Like, as you say, yeah. that's the relationship. I want, I want them to know I'm, I'm a good customer, I want them to know that I will keep spending money and this is what I like, um, you know, and having having store owners um, that, you know, there's probably four or five stores across Melbourne that know what I like, what mm. I want, and they look out for you. And that's just, like, that's gold. You can't, you know, places like JB Hi-Fi, which fill a need and they're an important part of the vinyl community in Australia, um, that's not what they do, you know. Mm. They're just, a, they're just a, a churn and burn kind of operation. That's fine, but... The independent stores, backbone of it all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we might jump to this, uh, the first album, I guess first album you own on vinyl or can remember uh, having in your collection. Yep. Uh, um, which is uh, ELO time. Yeah. So I, um, the first CD I ever bought was Michael Jackson Thriller because that I think was required by law and that's <laughs> what I did. And the second one was the Blues Brothers soundtrack because um, just I love that. Fantastic. Um, but, yeah, so I, ELO was, ELO was an act that I grew up listening to because my dad loved ELO. 
So he loved the Beatles. So my dad's two great loves beyond us as children, and even then it's a bit of a kind of tight race, I'd say, um, was Credence and the yeah. Beatles. Um, and so from the Beatles, he then got on to kind of ELO um, and Discovery by ELO was the really big album. So, I mean, I heard that so much in my in my house as a child um, and I, I grew to love it as well. Um, and I didn't really know because he, he didn't have any of the other ELO albums. Mm-hmm. I didn't know any of the early stuff or, you know, it's like out of the blue, like in the middle section and then like I knew none of the later stuff. Um, and when I first started collecting um, in St Kilda where I worked, there was a, um, quite a well-known record store um, called Round and Round that um, was just around the corner from work and had been run by this guy, this curmudgeon, for for decades. You know, he was a he was well known. Um, Round and Round was it called Record No Record Paradise. Sorry. Um, and I went in one day and I bought I bought um, ELO's Time, which I didn't really know anything about. Mm. And I bought an early Fleetwood Mac compilation, like the Peter Green kind of years. The, yeah, the cool. Stuff. Um, but yeah, Elo Time, um, the first time I ever heard it was on vinyl. Like I had never heard mm. it, never streamed it, never had it in cassette or anything. Um, and it's an incredible album. So uh, Jeff Lynn as an artist, I, I think Jeff Lynn is a genius. Jeff Lynn is a genius, um, up there with, you know, with McCartney, with Brian Wilson as a, as a constructor of, of, of melodies and as a producer, he's just, you know, he's incredible. Um, and so ELO really by the kind of like late seventies, after they really like their big peak. So with like out of the blue, which was massive, um, discovery, which was really big as well. Um, as they got into the eighties, it kind of members started to drop off and it started to become more of a, just kind of like a Jeff Lynn kind Mm. of machine really. Um, and time is basically a concept album uh, set in the future really. Um, but it is, it is so beautifully produced like it is very much of its time like it's an 80s album yeah like you totally yeah, you know since heavy yeah, oh, yeah, since, yeah. And like in the drums and stuff like it is it's very much of its time um and the lyrics are silly the lyrics don't make a lot of sense because Jeff Lynne is famous for he writes lyrics because his songs need lyrics but most ELO songs like you listen to the, the lyrics it's all a bit you know nonsensical right. you know? um <laughs> And, yeah, there's just a vibe to it that, I mean, I think it's the best ELO album. I think it's one of the best albums of the 80s. Um, you know, Ticket to the Moon and, um, like, the opening track, Twilight, um, is, like, it's, it's big and it's bombastic and it's um, it's not like, like, you know, ELO, you go back to their, their debut, they're essentially a prog rock band, mm. you know, with, um, with Roy Wood, that first kind of album. Um, and those early ones are very proggy, you know, with the kind of harsh cellos and that kind of stuff. Um, and then it, it kind of changes and gets more commercial. And then the last three albums are pretty much electronic, yeah. um, electronic albums. Um, it's a, yeah, a very kind of unique progression. Um, but yeah, time jumps out. And I highly recommend, like, if you've never heard time, um, seek it out. Cause it is, it's just very cool. It's very unlike anything else. Another band that's incredibly eclectic and you can sort of, when you listen, I, I was listening to it earlier today to remind myself of it. You can actually hear a lot of contemporary music in that album, even though it's very much of its time. You can you can hear influences and pick little moments where you sort of think, "Oh, that reminds me of yeah. X, Y, Z." Um, you know, uh, definitely an, an influential band, and um, weren't of. I mean, Jeff Lynne's not afraid to just do whatever was in his head. No, absolutely. You know, and and he. You know, he kind of had the luxury that successful artists often have mm. towards kind of middle or late part of their career, which was he had time, he had money, you know, he was able to, um, a bit like the kind of Steely Dan boys as well, by, you know, by the end, he was just in a studio and he had ideas and he was, you know, making the sounds mm. he wanted to make. Um, and so, and Secret Messages, which came after that, and then Balance of Power, which was the final album that came out in 86, all very synthy, very, you know, drum machines and that kind of stuff. But Balance of Power as well is a great album, you know, songs like So Serious on that um, are quintessential Lin. And so the Lin sound, I love the Lin sound. Like I could talk about the Lin sound all day. You know, you you, you think about the Travelling Wilburys, that is all Jeff Lin. Yeah. Um, you know, the production, you know, you, you think about um, Roy Orbison, um, you know, Mystery Girl, um, Cloud Nine, um, George Harrison, the Tom Petty stuff that he did. I would even argue that those acts like George Harrison and Tom Petty, the best stuff they did in the latter part of their career mm. was with Jeff Lynne, you know, um, and that's why I think they picked him to do Real Love and to do Freezer Bird, 
for the Beatles yeah. anthologies in the mid nineties, um, and that must have been you know, a wet dream for him to work with. You know, I mean, he idolised yeah. the Beatles, and to be able to work, you know, to get that tape from Yoko of Real Love and being able to work on that must have just been incredible. Um, yeah, it's probably a good uh, a good segue to. Um, your album that you received as a gift, you talked about your, your dad being a massive Beatles fan. Um, you're the, one of many box sets on the shelves behind you, that <laughs> Beatles uh, blue box set. Um, yeah. what, that's that's an amazing gift to to fill out any collection. Um, you know, as as someone who's a Beatles fan, that's, that's everything you need basically mm. in one box. Yeah, it is. Um, like I... Yeah, the Beatles are interesting. So the Beatles, the Beatles are probably the single biggest section in my collection in mm. terms of in terms of like number of records. Um, you know, the the recent boxes, the mono box from 2014, the stereo box, um, dozens and dozens of Japanese pressings. Like I've gone down the Japanese pressing rabbit hole with mm. the Beatles, you know, red vinyl and this basically beat a Beatles series every 10 years or so yep. um, in Japan. Um, you know, the audio file, the mobile fidelity pressings from the 80s, which are extremely sought after now and, you know, very expensive. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I grew up, I, I the Beatles, as much as any other act, were that indelible soundtrack um, to, to my childhood. Mm. Um, and the Blue Box, yeah, which was, again, massive. Like, that was the way that so many Beatles collectors um, ended up getting those albums. Yeah. They didn't buy them originally in the kind of 60s, um, or they picked up, you know, 70s reissues, that was the thing they got. Um, and the Blue Box was printed in about, I think, 30 different countries, had their wow. own variant of the Blue Box. Um, and there's some interesting variants out there. There's actually a gold version. You'll, it's quite rare and very expensive, but mm. the, the whole box is gold. It's, you know, impressive. Um, but, yeah, he, he had that. Um, and when he retired um, and that my parents were looking to downsize, he didn't really want to move the record collection and take mm. it with him. Um, he didn't. I mean, he only probably had 100 or so records um, and the only ones he really cared about were the Blue Box um, and his original Credence pressings, mm. which he had bought as a as a teen, um, much to the annoyance of his grandfather or his father, my grandfather, who had no interest in rock and roll and thought yep. it was crap. Um, but, yeah, so when he downsized, he got rid of everything except that Blue Box and the, and the Credence ones and I ended up, taking those because he didn't have record player. Yeah. Um, and I kind of, I take care of them really, you know, they're a, a part of my childhood. They're a part of his yeah. kind of life. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, that happens a lot these days. I think, you know, parents, baby boomers, I mean, essentially baby boomers passing their record collections down mm. to their kids who sometimes want it, other times just donate it or throw it out or whatever, which is a bit sad, but yeah. I mean, I can understand having now moved house with this collection four times. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't begrudge anybody <laughs> not wanting to be a record collector because it is a extremely um, inconvenient um, thing in many ways. Yeah, totally. That, that's yeah. probably the most uh, painful part of of the collecting, other than you know the care and making sure that that they're well looked after. That uh, yeah. storing and transporting. Yeah, it is. I mean, I. I think about um, like, you know, I've been quite lucky to travel overseas, you know, quite a bit and obviously record shops, you know, record shops and buying has always been a big part of that. Um, you know, the first time I went to, to Japan, I spent more on records than airfares and accommodation because <laughs> um, I went nuts in Tokyo, yeah. totally nuts. Uh, and I bought a couple of DJ bags and I was like, I don't really want to FedEx this stuff back. Like I want to, I want, I want to carry it back. I reckon I can work that out. So I got these DJ bags and I carried them on the plane. So I walked through customs in, in at Narita um, with these two huge heavy bags, like pretending they weren't heavy, trying to be, you yeah. know, oh, no, these are light, these are fine. Um, got them on the plane, got them in the overhead, um, got them back to Melbourne um, and, yeah, got them on the shelf. But, uh, yeah, it's it's so inconvenient, you know. Like it, it, it's exciting right up to the point you've got to move the bloody things. Yeah. How, how, many, how, how many do you do you know how many you have? It'd be north of three thousand. Wow. Um, in most ten of them, years, yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting. Like I I I spend a lot of time on on record collecting. I think you know, like anybody mm. that is passionate about anything, you know, whether it's going to the football or you know, collecting whatever. Um, and a lot of time, and and I mean, and a lot of money. Like I think 
collectors, I think there is this idea that you have to, like we were saying before, you have to do it one way. Mm. Now, there's people that buy 10 records a year and that's big for them. You know, like I see them on Instagram, you know, they, they've they saved up and they bought something and, and that's great. Like that's mm. their experience with them. I mean, everybody's experience of anything is in line with with their their capacity and their, their, their resource, you know, whatever mm. that might be, time, money, whatever. Um, and, yeah, it's been a big investment. And, you know, Discogs, I've got this insured for a, what is a very large amount of money, you know, and if this house burns down, I'm going to get a big fat check. Um, and but you I, won't have the records. I won't have the records and I won't have, I mean, I, I could pull any record out of that right now and tell you where I bought it and probably yeah. what I paid for it, you know, um, you know, whether it was in Brussels or it was in New York or it was, you know, around the corner. Um, and, you know, the memories there, like the, the thousands of hours, yeah. thousands of hours of my life or in the last 10 years on that. And that's partly why I, you know, if, if, if there is a fire and I lose it, I often think, would I start collecting again? Would I go through trying to get, you know, I mean, all the rare records, mm. all the, you know, the, the, the things that I've, you know, the box sets, the, um, yeah, would I, would I try to go down that path again and how would I feel about it psychologically? Yeah. Um, you know, about going and having two records on the shelf and then five and then ten as opposed to 3,000. Um, yeah, I don't know. Don't do know. you do you go through phases like to, is it just always growing or does it treat you know do you offload some? Do you go through and say oh, no, I don't need that in my collection anymore? Um, I've never sold a record, not one. Um, I've never I've never given any away mm. to anybody. Um, yeah, I've really it's just been and you know much to the chagrin of my partners, you know, through the years. Um, it's yeah. It's been like a never-ending kind of growth thing. Growth, yeah. um, and I've, I've obviously expanded shelving. You know, I've now got a whole room here for records. Very cool. Um, you know, I, I don't, I mean, do I need 10 pressings of, of you know, Sergeant Peppers? Or do I need, you know, I've got box, you know, prints and, and, you know, do I need seven different versions of, you know, Sign of the Times? Well, no, I don't. Of course I don't. You know, I've probably got 15 copies of the White Album, you know, across various <laughs> pressings and box sets and stuff. Um, I don't need that, you know, and I think... Anybody, if you try to rationalise and intellectualise why collectors do what they do, you're never going to work it yeah. out. You know, like it's it is it's about the thing. It's about having the thing. It's about the dopamine release of buying the thing. Like you know, I, there's albums that I have bought, the, the, um, you know, the, the duplicates of. I mean, different variants, but duplicates because I like the thrill of buying that album. Yeah. Like, I love that artist and I love that album and I get it in a brown paper bag and I bring it home with me, you know. It, logic plays no part in that, um, you know, and I I did a post on Insta the other day talking about why we collect and, you know, the, there's no right way or wrong way to yeah. collect um, and that, you know, the money we spend on it is an investment in the same way that, you know, like we invest in shares or real estate or we do things that are about making our life better ultimately financially, but there is a whole lot of other ways we need to make our life better as well um, and music, you mm. know, and and, I, and physical media and, and things I think does that in spades. Um, yeah. Should never be seen, you know, like I, th- I think there's, there's people that, that have partners or, or, you know, they're in situations where maybe it's not kind of understood why someone does what they mm. do, you know, and that that's money that's been taken away from other things. And, I mean, obviously, you know, like if you're not paying your rent or your mortgage, you yeah. probably shouldn't be buying might be a problem. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if you can, you know, if it's just a part of your your kind of, you know, expenditure um, and it brings you joy, then freaking do it. Like, yeah, it's, you know, going out to a nice restaurant, going yeah. to the pub with your mates, going, as you said, going mm. to the footy, mm. you know, what it's an outlet. It's something mm. that you enjoy, it brings you joy. And do you know what you... Um, yeah, just uh, just yesterday I went to Dutch and I grabbed. Um, they were playing a Towns Van Zandt album, and okay. it's someone that I've been listening to a bit lately who somehow eluded me for a long mm-hmm. time. And uh, and they were playing it, so they had a, a, a recent pressing of one of his albums. So I grabbed it and yep. putting it on, and just sitting down and listening to it. You, mm. It's you don't you know for me that's one of the and it's like going to a footy game and seeing your team win or. Mm. You know, going to the pub with your mates, it's like I am enjoying this. This is an awesome way to spend my Saturday mm. evening. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, and as much as it can be kind of fun, and we all do it, like we all look at we all look at other people, you know, whether they're in groups or individuals, you know, whether it's, 
they're building Lego or they've got this ridiculous car that's got vinyl wraps and neon lights mm. and wheels and all this stuff. Um, and, you know, and, unless you're involved in something and understand something, it's hard. I mean, you can, you can I mean, not laugh at it, but you can, you can look at it and go, what the hell are they doing? Like, why, why is this a thing? But for them, it's exactly the same as why does this guy have a wall of, has he not seen, <laughs> he not heard of Spotify? Like, yeah. what are you doing, mate? I'm uh, sure but, that people think that of us often. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You know, and it's, I totally get that. And they're not wrong. Like, like I said, if you applied logic, yeah. if you applied just, just pure Vulcan logic to it, nobody would collect records in yeah. 2022 because you would use Spotify, you would use other things. Um, and, you know, have it all in your pocket. Um, yeah. Maybe it's just stuff that isn't on there, but, you know, like it's, yeah, there's nothing. Can, like, yeah, you can't rationalise it. Just no. just take it for what it is and just enjoy it and take enjoyment from other people mm. getting enjoyment from things. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And that's, you know, I think that's the, one of the best things about the Instagram community is that, yeah, it, when it go when it you know when it's when it's working really well, it it does that really well. You know, it yeah. connects people. It you know you hear music and you see albums and things that you've you know maybe never seen before, never heard of. Um, got recommendations about things from people that you trust. Yeah, not from not from people that have either been given things for free or they've got some kind of you know dog in the race. Um, you know, uh, and I've, I've always been quite open. You know, like I I don't get. You know, free records. I think if I lived in America, I think I get a mm. lot of free records from the labels. But postage down here is a killer, yeah. so yeah. I just don't get any, and I'm totally fine with that. Like I'm not looking for free stuff. I have no interest in it, um, and I also don't. You know, some of, some people on Insta that I'm quite close with, you know, do get stuff from you know Warner Records or mm. you know, other labels. Um, and look, that's fine. Like I understand. I mean, it's free records. Who's going to say yeah. no? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, and if it's an artist that you're already kind of connected with, it kind of makes sense. But I yeah. I don't have I don't have a lot of time for labels that are sending free records out to people. And like I understand indie bands and people do it to get exposure. Like mm. that, that's kind of fine, but. You know, like if someone's getting a free Guns N' Roses album, like Axel doesn't need the money. Mm. Like why are we kind of selling ourselves for, you know, what is, what, a $50 record? It just, it, it feels a bit icky to me, mm. but, mm. you know, again, each of their own. Like I don't judge, do your thing. That, the vinyl community, though, um, it, it is really cool. You know, it's just another outlet to share your hobby with other people and to, to see others. I mean, there's been times where you've posted something where I've thought, I don't have that in my collection. Why don't I have that in my collection? And then the next time I'm at the store, it's in the back of my mind, you know, maybe if I see, mm. you know, Airs Rock or if I see, uh, you know, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs or you know, mm. something that you've been sharing on. Yeah. You collect Aussie vinyl now, for yeah. example, and, and I'm going, geez, that, that's a gap. I got, you know, mm. that's got to be in my collection. So you, you sort of, you know, it's it's almost like going to a record fair or yeah. You're going to a swap meet and you're talking to other collectors, but you're just doing it online. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's what it, it does really, really well. Um, and yeah, the whole Aussie account, like I've dropped the ball with that. I started it cause I like, I got a lot of like, I'm a huge, mm. huge fan of like, you know, mid sixties to late seventies, um, Australian, you know, the Oz rock stuff, mm. um, stuff that, you know, we were, if we weren't so far away, these acts would have been huge. huge. Like Bobby yeah. Lloyd, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs, you know, Sid Rumpo, Chain, um, Matt Lake, like all these incredible artists, you know, festival records, mushroom records. Yeah. It was a, you know, it was a, a golden age. Um, and a lot of it never really left our shores, you know, and the few kind of bands that did it a little bit later, you know, bands like Little River Band, which, you know, did really well, but you go back earlier, you know, with people like Glenn Shark to bands like Axiom. Axiom is an incredible band. Um, and, you know, if you've never heard of Axiom or they released two albums before mm-hmm. they imploded, um, The Fool's Gold and um, What If, incredible, incredible albums um, that, you know, had Glenn Shark been American, he'd be living in a 50-room mansion now. Yeah. Not a problem. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's good. Yeah. I mean, of all of those you mentioned that, uh, Aztecs Live at Sunbury is still one of my oh. absolute favorite albums in my collection. Like yeah. the, you just can't, it, it's a recording, but you just can't help but feel the energy. No. And I'm just, as you are talking, I'm, um, I'm just looking behind me because one of the absolute jewels in my collection. So I've got the entire Billy Thorpe and the Aztec, like all the, all the stuff, mm. you know, steaming at the opera house, um, more arts than class, which I think is one of the great 
studio albums mm. ever recorded in Australia. But the original Live at Sunbury actually had a cardboard wraparound that came with it um, that was actually a 3D model of hippies in a tent. Oh, and so wow. We actually popped it out and he made a, a tent. Um, and you never find it with that because they yeah. were popped out and used. But I found one when I first started collecting um, at Dixon's, which is a, like a, a secondhand store chain in Melbourne, and I paid about 100 bucks for it, which at the time yeah, I was starting, that was a lot of money. Like to spend 100 bucks on a record, um, my partner at the time I think was also like just, that, that's abhorrent, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but it's incredibly rare and hard to find out, so I'm glad I've got it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Thorpey, like Thorpey, Thorpey was just, just one of the greats. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, I certainly appreciated, you know, still to this day, but I think probably underappreciated as well for just yeah. how good those kind of 70s albums are. Yeah, spot on. Uh, we might jump to your your live album. So, again, Sinatra, Sinatra at the Sands. Sinatra was a re- another really big artist in my house because um, Dad toured with Sinatra in the wow. 90s when Sinatra came to Australia. So they were opening a casino in Queensland and they actually paid Sinatra to come out. Um, and he was probably in his mid to late 70s by then, so he was definitely kind of end of life, you know, yeah. to use a, a bad phrase. Um, but the MSO played with him, and so Dad went up to Queensland and Amazing. they and did concerts. And he came back from that, and that concert just blew his mind. Like he, he not that he wasn't a fan before, but mm. it was never really something we heard in the house but he came back from that and it was all Sinatra all yeah, the okay. time. Um, and so he and still I, had it even even in, in that late period of Oh, time. yeah. I mean, he was he was reading the lyrics from TV screens, you know, like his memory was a little bit dodgy. Mm. But even then, I mean, all the orchestra members, like I, I remember them all talking about it. And it was just like this is a guy that on stage, like he knows and we know that he's doing this better than anybody that's ever done it before. You yeah. know, and his, his, his command of the stage and the song, I mean, these songs and these charts, which are 50, 60 years old and still played note for note the way yeah. that, you know, the great arrangers, you know, Nelson Riddle and Gordon Jenkins and others um, wrote them, still played exactly the same because they're so good. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and he came back from that and it was just so much Sinatra. And, again, I absorbed that and I, you know, I developed a love for, for, for big band, for swing. You know, there's something about a big band. Like no matter what music you love, whether, you know, again, whether it's heavy metal or it's rap or it's whatever, a big band is thrilling. Yeah. You know, there's a sound and an energy in a big band. You know, having 20 or 30 people make this sound, um, and, you know, Sinatra at the Sands recorded, you know, right in the middle of the 60s when he was at his peak, you know. Yeah. The Rat Pack was huge. Um, you know, they owned Vegas. It was all mobbed up. Um, you know, he had Quincy Jones. So, yeah. You know, but Quincy Jones conducting. Count um, Bassi and his orchestra. Count, yeah, so you yeah. got the Count Bassi orchestra. Quincy Jones conducting. He was, I think, about 27, 28. Um, and you had Sinatra, without a doubt, probably the most famous entertainer on the planet, really, you know, with one or two, you know, competitors potentially. Um, and that album, there's an energy on that album from the very beginning when the announcer announces him and the, and the band kicks in um, and those songs, you know, Fly Me to the Moon and, and you know, all of that. Um, yeah, it's incredible. It takes you to a moment in time. Mm. But also, again, there's a, there is an, a, an um, there's no effort that you ever hear in a Sinatra recording yeah. or in a Sinatra album, the voice and the mastery of that voice, you know, it, it was effortless. That's a great you know, way to describe it. Yeah, no, you know, he, he practised, I mean, in his in his teens, in his 20s, in his 30s, you know, like the breathing techniques that he copied from trumpeters and that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he, he knew what he was doing and he knew, again, you know, like people that came after, he knew what sound he wanted. So he mm. knew what arrangers to use. He knew what arrangements he wanted. He picked the right songs. Like he was a great picker of songs, um, you know, in the American, the great American songbook, the, his versions are still to this day so often the kind of definitive version, like Fly Me to the Moon. Yeah. For all the hundreds of versions of Fly Me to the Moon, Sinatra, Don't Fly Me to the Moon, is the version. Um, I think it, it, it takes you to a place that doesn't exist anymore, that, you know, people our age and, I mean, even our parents' age really, you know, Vegas mm. is, wasn't a part of, of, of that life. But yeah. you can get a romance from that that is, you know, extremely visceral really. Like it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a smell and a feel and, a, um, yeah, just a, a, a whole thing on that album that there's no other live album that I can really think of that, you know, does that for me mm. quite as viscerally. It does, it, uh, 
a lot of the Sinatra stuff almost doesn't seem real. It's it sounds like fiction when and mm. it's and it's so far ago that you, as you said, you can sort of romanticize it. But it, it was all pretty full on, uh, mm. you know. The, his, his, you know, what he was mixed up in. But um, mm. you know, his life was was like a, a Hollywood movie. Oh, absolutely. You know, and and he. I, you know, he, those kind of capital years with like the really big, you know, capital mm. records albums. Uh, and then he got sick of capital uh, and actually formed his own record label, which was yeah. unheard of, you know, reprise records. Reprise, yeah, yeah, reprise, yeah, to yeah. go off and create that, you know, the, the star power that you need to be able to do that, to, to own your masters, to kind of be in charge of your yeah. own destiny. Um, very similar to what Taylor Swift is, is yeah, doing. Yeah, I was just now. about I mean, to say, yeah. You know, Sinatra re recorded a lot of stuff that he'd done at Capitol yeah. on reprise, and the reprise versions are just a shitload better. Mm. Um, you know, they're, they're, they swing more, they like, there's a whole lot more balls to them um, because times have started to change as well. And, you know, the kind of sound the 50s wanted, the kind of Bing Crosby, very kind of Gentile, yeah. um, you know, whereas the 60s, the swinging 60s, which Sinatra was the epitome of, um, yeah, those reprise albums. I wanted some more oomph. Oh, yeah, much yeah. more. And that's, you know, um, there's actually a, there's an album that Mobile Fidelity released a while back. It's actually the Count Basie set before Sinatra comes on. Ooh. So recorded in the same set of concerts and it's all instrumental because it's just the Basie yeah. band. But, I mean, the again, the energy on that, like, the, you know, the big band, um, and I've, I've seen big bands over the years, um, you know, and even the bad big band, to be quite honest, it's just bloody exciting, you know. It's it, it's like going to see, you know, the Beethoven you know, Ninth Symphony with, the, with all, the, all the choral stuff. Yeah. You can't not get absorbed, you know. Again, I don't care what kind of music you like. You sit in a concert hall and you listen to the Ode to Joy, you are getting goosebumps yeah. 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, so Saturday night album. I am going to, um, yeah, look, Donald Fagan, Nightfly is one of my, probably a top five album, yep. maybe on its day, top two, wow. maybe. Um, you know, I am a huge Steely Dan fan. I think Steely Dan is just one of the great bands. Their albums and the albums that those two guys put together are unlike anything else in music. Like Steely Dan is one of the few bands I can, or few artists I can think of that has no real artist you can point to as a kind of line of lineage. You know, yeah. like you, think about, you know, the, the Beatles or, or you know, Grateful Dead or whoever the band is, you can usually track through the fifties to the sixties to an influence. You know, and a lot of it was frankly us just stealing black music because yeah. that's mostly what we did. Um, but Steely Dan. It doesn't have that. Like from the very first album that they kind of landed, you know, Can't Buy a Thrill, um, there is a sound and a, and a kind of musical vision there that is, it's it's kind of rock, it's kind of jazz, it's kind yeah. of a whole lot of things, but it's like nothing else. Distinctly um, Steely Dan. It's distinctly Steely Dan, you know, and yeah. complex jazz, you know, jazz chords, jazz patterns, um, you know, and the, the characters they create and the stories they tell, very much like Randy Newman, they kind of create these, often quite offensive characters, people doing things they shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, and it, you really just kind of get sucked into it. And then you throw in the best studio musicians that the world had to offer um, on these records and then the sound quality as well, you know, the, the production of it. Um, yeah, you know, they're incredible. Pretzel Logic, Katie Lied, Asia, which is, you know, Asia is just a monumental um album, um, you know, and then out through kind of Royal Scam and, and Gaucho and then it ended, you know, they had cocaine habits and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, Donald went off and recorded The Nightfly, which is really interesting because it's a very romantic, nostalgic album. Um, it's a bit autobiographical, so it's very much him reflecting on his kind of youth in the kind of in the fifties, and you know the the kind of cultural change happening in that kind of you know pre moon landing, pre Kennedy mm. kind of era. You know, it was all very much you know white bread, leave it to Beaver kind of you know simplicity. Yep. And I mean, it's, the songs are incredible. The production is incredible. Um, and there is again a bit like um, Beck Sea Change. There is a vibe to that album that is incredibly consistent. Yeah. Um, and it takes you to another place. And yeah, it's, you've got to listen to it in a darkened room. You know, it just it takes you away. Um, headphones on the bus doesn't doesn't have the same, you know, they're great songs. Yeah. But it is it is part of an experience for me. And you kind of have to do it in a certain way. Um so so 
your Saturday night album, what what is that experience? Why is it a Saturday night? Talk me through that. You've pulled it off the shelf and, and you're putting it on the turntable. Um, look, I think it's it's one of those albums you get to a certain point, you know, I guess on a, you know, on a, on a, on a night. Um, I'm not one of these people that for me music Yes, it, it partly it's about ramping you up and the you know, the energy and the excitement, you know, and and all of that. But uh, I think for me, what I often use music for is, um, I guess, to to disappear into it. Like I do a lot of critical listening, and like it's a very wanky term, but I guess ultimately what I mean is that I sit down and I listen to a record, mm. you know, which is ultimately like what they were designed to do and what kind of digital often took away from us because we could pick and we could select and whatever. Yeah. Um, you so know, active, actively experiencing it's actually, the actually listening. Yeah, you know, and and even, I mean, up until very recently, how my land rooms have been kind of arranged in various houses, often there hasn't been a TV. Like mm. the land room has been a music room and it's been for listening to records, um, you know, and, and the Nightfly is one of those albums. And, I mean, there's others, but certainly it is what I listen to a lot and it is just kind of... Yeah, it's a way to just kind of step away from everything else that happens in the world. In the day, you know, the, everything else in life and to just, yeah, disappear into this world that somebody created and slaved over. Like mm. that album is, you know, like all the Steely Dan albums, if you can't hear it on a Steely Dan or a Donald Fagan album, your system is garbage. Mm. Every single thing, every every little hi-hat, every, every pluck of a string, every bass note, every whatever – is all perfectly there, and the 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 effort and the slavish devotion to that sound quality, which is actually why a lot of people don't like Steely Dan. They feel that it's too clinical and it's too mm. it's not musical enough. It, it's too sterile. Which there's some truth to that, if I'm honest. But that doesn't phase me. I love that part of it. I love hearing something the way they wanted me to hear it. Yeah. Um, and experience it the way they wanted me to experience it. And I, you know, I would think that, you know, both Walter and Don would be very, you know, happy to know that people enjoy their albums and their music in that way as albums because they, you know, some people spend less energy raising their children than those two guys did on putting those albums together. So the least we can do is to actually, you know, focus on them. Yeah, appreciate minutes, them. Yeah. To appreciate them, yeah, you know, Um and also there's some bloody great pressings, you know, not to kind of nerd out, but, you know, I've got there's, look, there's a, a, a famous pressing of Asia by a, a label called Cisco um, who did it, I think, about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and they now go for five, six, seven hundred dollars um, And they did them from the original master tape. Mm. And it is like, I mean, it's mind-blowing, you know, on a good system, um, you know, and that, that's the thing as well is that, well, yes, okay, you can play records on any system and, you know, you still enjoy music, but hi-fi when hi-fi comes into its own, you can sit in your lounge room or you can have guests and you can put a record on and Ella Fitzgerald is in the room. Yeah. Muddy Waters, you know, a folk singer, you know, 60 years ago they recorded that and Mobile Fidelity just did one of their fancy one-step pressings like the, the 45 box and I bought it the other day and listened to it and you're in the studio in 1964 with Muddy Waters. It's incredible. Yeah. That's what hi fi is about. That's why, you know, the money we spend on it is so worthwhile. And, and you, you uh, in your Instagram account and in your bio, you talk about audiophile, mobile fidelity, Japanese pressings. You're, um, you have a lot of mobile fidelity pressings. I haven't, yep. um, I haven't gone down that rabbit hole yet. I've, <laughs> looked, I've looked at the website many times yeah. and yeah. looked at what's coming out and, and what's sold out. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm certainly familiar with the work that they do. Um, you've, you've spoken passionately about the reasons that those are so, um, that those pressings are so extraordinary. The setup obviously makes a big difference. What's um, just, just for the listeners and for those sort of, I guess, is aspiring to upgrade, slowly upgrade their hi-fi setup. I'm, I'm in, I'm on number two of my kind of journey. Yeah. What's, um, what's your current setup and, and how does that play into that audio file mobile fidelity mm -hmm. experience? Yeah, I mean, I look, I think it's – look, audio file stuff is definitely a really big rabbit hole. It's not a rabbit hole you need to go down to to enjoy any particular album or any particular, you know, music. But I think if you're in a position to go down that rabbit hole whilst also balancing your hi-fi setup with the quality that those records can give you, 
it's a very luxurious, lovely kind of way to experience music. Um, my my hi-fi rig is very modest. Like you know, there are there are six figures in you know there's, there's collectors I follow that have got a hundred grand of hi-fi mm. or even more. You know, and I'm just it blows me away. Yeah. Um, um, I've spent probably ten times, twenty times as much on records than I have on actual hi-fi. Um, so I've got um, I've got a the turntable is um, by a company called JA Michelle. Um, they're a uh, British um, company. I've uh, been around for decades and decades. Um, you know, not particularly high end. You know, I mean, a, th- a few thousand Australian dollars. You know, so not not crazy. Um, I've got a what have I got? So I've got a, a Rager amp, got a Rager CD player. Um, I've got uh, my phono stage is by a European company called Lehman Audio, um, which again, not high end, you know, yeah. a thousand bucks, fifteen hundred dollars, which I mean is a lot of money. I'm not saying that it's not, but you know, my whole hi fi with the speakers as well, which are um, Dali, who are um, a, a Danish company, let's say it's let's say it's fifteen grand. Yeah, um, you know, um, not outrageous. I'm a bit bored secondhand, but that you know, I've, I've got the the Audifon 2M black cartridge, which is about a thousand bucks Australian. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it, there's money there, but it's not. I mean, it, it pales into insignificance. Whereas the the collection behind me is well into six figures, and mm-hmm. I'm not even going to share the number because it's obscene. That for me is where I get the most benefit from that investment. Like I could have a hundred grand of hi-fi in that room. Yeah. Um, and I could have a collection that's probably half the size or, you know, less kind of grandiose. But I think one of the things that I think happens with a lot of hi-fi um, uh, people is they start to lose sight of what is actually happening and what it is about, you know. Not all of them, like some, some of them really, you know, it is about the music and they mm. always have that front centre. But I definitely, you know, there's definitely people on Instagram or just in the hi-fi community that the gear and, and experiencing the, the gear by way of the music as opposed to experiencing the music by way of the gear yeah. definitely happens. You know, there's a status element to it, so being able to show you got a $30,000 turntable and $100,000 speakers, like there is diminishing returns. The difference between a pair of $50,000 speakers and $100,000 speakers is not big enough, not even mm. close to being big enough to justify that additional money. Yeah. To my mind, you know, yeah. um, and I, you know, like mobile fidelity or analog productions or, you know, any of the kind of audiophile labels, um, they they spend a lot of time and energy and money to create as good a record as they can. You know, the big, the big labels, the big, the big companies, often they want to produce a good product. You yeah. know, they want to mass produce something, you know, they want to be able to go to a factory, you know, the Czech Republic and press a hundred thousand of them and most of them will be okay. Um, but you know, mobile fidelity, you get the tapes, you've got, you know, you've got, um, remastering engineers, you've got really lovely equipment, you know, you, you put the packaging together, you, you go and press them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've got, you know, there's probably 250 odd mobile fidelity records down there. And a lot of them are definitive, you know, like they're just as good as I've ever heard these albums on any format. Um, you know, it was like Dire Straits. They just did all the Dire Straits albums um, without um, the last one. But, mm. you know, double 45s and, you know, these sound incredible. You know, the drums, the bass, there is a, there's a quality there that, you know, Super Audio CD or streaming or the original pressings or like they all sound good because, you know, Brothers in Arms is a really well-produced album, mm. but um, Mobile Fidelity gets more out of it. And certainly on my system, like, I get a sound that is extremely satisfying and makes the record worth the hundred dollars or the hundred and fifty or whatever I paid for it. Um, is there a threshold? Do you think with the type of gear? I mean, obviously, if you're chucking it on a Crosley, a mobile fidelity, yeah. a Crosley is probably not uh, going to get you that same outcome. But where do you think that threshold is of um, the the level of your setup and and yeah. the worthwhile of of chasing those sort of records? Um, oh, look, I think, I think you, you would probably expect to see at least a couple of grand, you know, so, I mean, a couple of Australian, a couple of thousand Australian dollars, you know, maybe that's 1,000, 1,500 US or, yeah. you know, whatever, um, you know, with a, a, a decent turntable from, you know, whether it's Rager or Project or U-Turn or, yeah. Sort of, yeah, you know, um, a decent cartridge, you know, so not, not, not a turntable. Not stock. Maybe. Yeah. Where the arm comes with the cartridge, you can't change it, you know, or it's you know something like that. I think th- you've got to get to the point where um, 
yeah, there's some baseline of, of quality in inverted commas mm. um, because, yeah, the fact is that, you know, a, a $200 audio file pressing, it simply can only do so much. And, you know, uh, on a turntable that's not designed to yeah. kind of match that, you're just wasting your time and you're wasting your, you know, your money. I mean, I think it's still a record you can enjoy. Mm. But it's kind of like you know, one of the things that um, happens in the digital world with super audio CDs is you can buy the super audio CD and it plays fine on a normal CD player because there's a normal CD layer on it. But if you've got the super audio CD player, you can play the mm. higher res layer and then you get that additional experience. And that's really, I think, you know, what it, what it is. Yeah. Um, I would look, I would recommend you know for, for someone that is interested and you know and the labels put out the kind of records and artists you're interested in you know mm. whether it's Stevie Ray Vaughan or Dire Straits or you know w- whatever the artist yeah. is. Um, I don't think people should buy audiophile albums because they want to hear how good it sounds. You know, like if you don't if you don't want to listen to Miles Davis kind of blue, don't go and buy yeah. two hundred box. Because yeah. yes, it will sound great, but ultimately, like, what are we doing? Like, well, like what's the point of that? Um, you know, and audiophile labels, they know their market. They know that it's a it's a very much a middle class, you know, kind of product. Yeah. Um, they're priced as such. So they, they're not trying to be everything to everybody. That's not their point. They are a niche product. They're a luxury item in yeah. the same way that a Louis Vuitton handbag is a luxury item. No yeah. one needs it. But for some people, it, it it serves a purpose. Totally, and yeah. that that takes us uh, quite nicely to your final uh, record. I think you, you did have two here. Maybe we could. The first one that you actually have in your possession is a mobile fidelity uh, pressing. Do you want to talk yeah. to us about that, and then maybe we can talk about the elusive quest for that other holy grail? Yeah. So when I first started collecting, I did a lot of eBay stuff. So I. I knew because I'd, I'd collected quite a few mobile fidelity gold CDs, and so I kind of I knew that they were they were an important kind of part of the audiophile like um, world. You know, they essentially created you know back in the seventies with their Dark Side of the Moon yeah. pressing that really created the audiophile industry as we kind of know it now. And so when I started collecting, um, I started to seek out. Their, some of their pressings, you know, like Super Tramp, Breakfast in America and the Dark Side of the Moon was one of the first ones I got and I just started to kind of add to it and add to it. Um, and in the 90s, so they their history is they've kind of gone bankrupt a few times and they've changed hands and they have a very kind of, it's a very interesting mm. history as a company. Uh, and in the 90s, they did a, a series of, of new pressings of very interesting eclectic kind of choices. Um, they did Sonic Youth. Um, they did you know, Primus, um, <laughs> stuff you wouldn't expect. Uh, and they did Nevermind. They obviously got permission um, and yep. they got the, the tapes. Um, and they did that. They did 5,000 uh, pressings, uh, which I'm sure dutifully sold out at the time. Yep. Um, and I... New, I mean, again, you know, Nirvana, very much a product and, a, a, a you know, a, a part of my kind of teen experience, yeah. you know, that, that album was a, a zeitgeist thing. Like I think we can all remember, you know, the of Seattle brunch thing just kind of exploding. Um, and, yeah, I knew I wanted to get a copy um, and I was kind of watching and, and waiting and kind of working how it was going to happen. And I won an eBay auction. Uh, I bought it on eBay. Um, I think I paid maybe 200 Australian, so let's say about 130 US maybe yep. at the time, um, that record now regularly goes for north of a 1000 bucks. Yeah. 1500 I think, I mean, a sealed copy you'd probably get two grand for if you, yep. you know, really tried. Um, and it sounds amazing. Like there's different opinions. I mean, I mean, opinions, you know, everyone's got an opinion. Like everybody, you know, whether it's an original pressing or, you know, whether it's there's been some other reissue, like there's lots of different versions of Nevermind, you know, and there's even just been a new um, a new um, anniversary yep. box released, which I'm sure sounds great as well. Um, but there is a, yeah, there's definitely an energy um, on the mobile fidelity pressing um, and it just jumps out of the speakers. Like it's, I mean, the album itself does that, but yeah, yeah it's definitely a, there's a, um, a sound quality and a pressing quality on that that is um, is pretty amazing. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy. I I probably wouldn't pay a thousand bucks for it now. Like it's not something that I. I mean, I'm emotionally connected to it, but not to the point where yeah. money would be no object. Like I just don't think I would spend a thousand dollars 
Um, and there's probably a lot, like I said before, like would I go down the path of rebuilding this collection, you know, like yeah. I, even just looking at what's kind of sitting behind me now and some of those box sets, like there's a um, there's a Queen box set up there which was released in the 80s, which was all the Queen albums up to that point. Um, and you don't see them very often, you know, and the price starts to go up and yep. the new Queen box actually is the one you want, um, printed on or pressed on coloured vinyl, very expensive but incredible and blows every other version of those Queen albums out of the water. Um, but, yeah, like the, the, the Nevermind, it's, it's, a, it's a real holy grail, I think, in the, in the, certainly in the, in the mobile fidelity collecting community and just more broadly, I think, with record collectors that are aware of, of you know, of yep. those things. Um, and, yeah, it's mean condition, you know, it looks like the day was pressed and, you know, it's nice to have that there on the shelf. Awesome. Yeah. And, you, and there is one, um, surprisingly, there is an album that has eluded you, given um, how many you've amassed. Yeah, so I did, the, yeah, the Led Zeppelin. So when I, the first time I went to Japan, I was in maybe Reco Fan or maybe it was a Disc Union, one of the, like, one of the big kind of, you know, well-known record stores, and they had a copy of, so the original pressing of Led Zeppelin debut album, mm. the letter in is turquoise. Yeah. So not the orange that we now know it, it, it was turquoise. And it was pulled for some reason. I'm not exactly sure what the reason was, but it was pulled yeah. and then it was redesigned and repressed. So they are, I mean, they go for huge money. Yeah, they're rare. Led Zeppelin, you know, next to probably the Beatles and Pink Floyd is the most collectible band, Yeah. Um, you know, in my, I guess in my kind of travels and my experience. Um, so there's big money there for Led Zeppelin anyway, you know, like the the um, the Bob Ludwig um, hot cut of yep. Led Zeppelin 2 is very collectible, very, you know, hard to find these days. Um, and I saw one of these turquoise Led Zeppelin ones at, at this Japanese record store and I think they wanted what was, I think, 160,000 yen, which was about 1,600 Australian dollars or so. Like you divide yeah. by 100 loosely. Um, that's about 80, I think, but I did by 100. Um, it was like $1,600. And I was, again, new to collecting. So, you know, $100 for a record was like, okay, this is pretty steep. Um, whereas now, you know, like it, it sounds so like middle class, but yeah. $100, I can manage that. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, but $1,600, like that's, that's serious money. Um, and I look back at it now, you know, and not that I buy records to invest at all. Like that is not the purpose of, I think, why anybody should buy records. Um, but yeah, there would have been a sound investment to pick that up at that point. Yeah. Um, and I've never seen another one live. So five to seven oh, grand oh. seems kind of yeah. standard for those, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, condition is king, you know, like that's, uh, that's what, one of the other things about my collection is, I have nothing in here that is not, I mean, I'm, you know, near mint or as close to near mint as I wow. can get. Like I, I don't have, and, you know, like every, every collector does it differently. I have no time for, for you know, seam splits and busted covers and, you know, people that wrote, the, wrote their names on yeah. it or, you know, it's got footprints on it or, you know, it's been through the washing machine. Um, I will wait and I will look yeah. and find a clean copy and I will pay the money. Like that's, I think, you know, every, every collector does it differently, but um, I would rather wait and pay $100 for a super clean, beautiful mm. copy of an album than spend 40 bucks or 50 bucks and get, okay, well, the record is fine, but the cover's a bit shit or yeah. vice versa. Um, it just doesn't appeal to me. You know, condition is as important, if not more important, mm. Um, as having it, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. And even as a as a Japanese, like there's hundreds of Japanese pressings in there. I actually don't think I own a single Japanese album that doesn't have the Obi strip. Cool, um, wow. The, the Obi strip. That's is, quite a feat. Yeah, yeah. The you know, and I, I've passed on Japanese pressings of albums I wanted mm. to wait for. You know, like all the I've got, you know, 30, 40, 50, probably more Japanese Beatles pressings up there. They all have the obby because that is, and that is an essential part of that package. You know, it, it was how the Japanese communicated to the to the buying public what the record yeah. was. They weren't printing their own um, albums covers. Yeah. They were using the the stock standard one, but they needed to actually advertise and and tell the the non English speakers what it was. Um, and I love that. Like it's that's such a part of it for me. I you know there's a romance to the obby strip and their works of art in, in and of themselves. Totally. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I, I will say um, I'm I I'm not quite as uh, particular as you. I, I have bought some uh, albums that are more VG VG plus. Um, I find where I let it slip is um, at the moment. I'm I, I've actually just recently finished chasing Albert label pressings of ACDCs yep. up to uh, for those about to rock. Yep. Um, past there, I'm not 
too interested if they if I come across them I'll get them yeah. but um yeah but but with those um you know as you would know yeah. they go for a lot of money um but you can get away with uh, a bit worse off of pressing with something like yeah. ACDC but jazz stuff which I've you know really probably only in the last two years really started chasing hard is um you know you, you almost have to get that sort of VG plus near mint or yeah it's not a great listening experience. No. I mean, I think what's interesting, and the, and the like the Akadaka is a really, really good example. Um, you know, I've also tried to chase, you know, chase down quite a bit of that early. I'm a, you know, much more a Bon Scott kind mm, of yeah, um, you know, ACDC, you know, all the Blue Roos and those kind of, you know, that kind of thing. Um, because they're albums that were played, they were taken to parties, they were yeah. actually, like, they were used, as you say, like there's a um, there's a, a lived-in feel to a lot of them. And I mean, I would, you know, as much as I kind of you know, made the blanket statement, definitely for those kind of albums that are historically important as well as musically important, um, yes, you know, you could find super clean copy, you know, like a, a really lovely, clean, you know, original Australian president of Back in Black, which obviously not Bon Scott, but mm. they, they're going for hundreds now. Like those yeah. prices are really starting to creep up because so many of them are thrashed. So if one, if one is, you know, you find one that is in beautiful condition, um, yeah, you're going to pay for that. But, mm. you know, also I think something, you know, about Akadaka, there's something nice almost about the fact that, you know, this has been used, you know. Like I think, you know, Bon himself would probably much rather you have a, you know, a, a, a copy that's, you know, been through the ringer and it's, you know, <laughs> Beer a couple on, of beer stains on, on the label, rather than it's been kept in like an archival sleeve for forty-five yeah. years. And um, but yeah, I mean, look, you know, th- yeah, there are exceptions. There are there are simply albums that you're never going to find, you know, in that kind of mm. that really pristine kind of condition. But as long as it plays well, like I, I, I will also put up. You know, I will be fine with a cover that maybe is you know not quite as nice as I would like if the record is really clean. Yeah, like, I don't want I don't want to buy like a record that's been graded G, you know, and it's it's hissy and poppy and like. I love the surface noise of vinyl, but mm. I've got, there's a real line. Um, and even with a record cleaning machine, like I've got a project up there, which I use pretty regularly. Like if, it, if it's noisy, it goes into a pile and I will either donate it or I'll give it away or whatever. Yeah. Not it's much. a, ACDC is a bit more forgiving than a lot, than, than most, you know, you can look at something yeah. and, and think, geez, that's, that's scr- scratch to buggery. And then, you put it on and, and you can't hear it over the distortion anyway. So yeah. most price, I mean, yeah, the I mean the, the Akadaka prices are the starting. Blue ruse are oh just, yeah. 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 You know, you're starting to get in a four, five, six, seven hundred bucks. Um, which I mean, look, I I think that is money well spent. You know, I think that is that they're, they're pieces of music history, particularly Australian, you know, for Australian music fans and collectors. Um, you know, which is partly why I spent a lot of time and money building, you know, the, the entire Billy Thorpe collection. Yeah, yeah. Those are it's an which, archive. Thankfully, they've been reissued now. Like Aztec Music, you know, has done all those on CD, and like they, you know, they they put so many of those great Australian albums and, and artists out there. But yeah, like you know, those records, they are yeah, they're a they're a piece of our our history. That um, unless you are Australian, I mean, you know, most Americans, Europeans, that music didn't leave our shores. It's mm. really ours. You know, Billy went to LA and made some frankly appalling albums, uh, and then came back. Um, didn't quite work out for him, but yeah, yeah. Well, mate, thank you so much for taking the time oh, to, um, to share your passion and your collection. Um, yeah, it's an incredible uh, collection that you've amassed and um, really appreciate particularly um, all the work you do on Insta, just, uh, you know, sharing that passion and love for music. It's awesome. No, look, thank you. Yeah, it's been great to chat. Um, yeah, no, it is. It's, it's a great community. It's a, it's a great hobby and passion. And, uh, yeah, I would anybody that is tinkering on the edge or toying with taking the dive in, um, yeah, I think there's, there's worse ways to spend your time. So. Yeah, spot on. Great. Awesome, mate. Oh, thanks thank so much for your time. Cheers. Have a good Absolutely. Sunday evening. Yeah, you too. Cheers, right. mate. Chat soon. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. The Groovy Guys are Tom Kennedy, Dan Lozier, Chris Palumbo, and Matt Carvalho. With your host, Tom Kennedy, music by Dan Lozier, post-production by Matt, and album art by Chris. 